ठीक है अच्छा ही कर रहा हाँ बहुत बिलीव करूंगा ठीक <laughs> है सर ओके सो वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ अफसल मॉल जी एम सी एच चंडीगढ़ आई एक्सटेंड वेरी वार्म वेलकम टू प्रोफेसर जे एस टी टयाल दॉक टूडे प्रोफेसर जे एस टी टयाल इज करंटली चीफ ऑफ आर पी सेंटर as well as dean research at aims new delhi so uh, professor tetyal is is rated among the top 2% uh, scientist in ophthalmology in our country and um, had more has more than 400 publications and professor tetyal has received almost all orations in uh, our country more than 30 orations and sir has also uh, been conferred padam shri by government of india for his contribution to the in the field of ophthalmology and he sir is very very active uh, academically in all our societies national as well as international societies and sir has delivered more than 1000 talks in various national and international fora and, and he has conducted more than 100 lectures and he has also conducted more than surgery i have served in various corporations and whenever i tell my resident i always say that sir is in fact he is involved in reverse teaching so he is the only surgeon from our country who has done live surgery at american academy of ophthalmology so with this brief intro introduction i again welcome professor j s tetyal for today's lecture uh, welcome sir welcome for today's lecture thank you uh, professor suresh uh, such a nice uh, introduction very kind of you uh, indeed you know uh, education is one of the most important part for everybody's life not only in the medical field it has to be lifelong process we keep learning from every area every area of contact we keep learning and being in ophthalmology ophthalmology i think uh, we should uh, be master in cataract surgery at least and the students have a huge responsibility because we know that uh, we have a huge number of patients suffering from cataract and the mo modern technology should be you know understood by us and give the best possible visual outcome after cataract surgery to our patient and uh, let me share my ppt to, for today which uh, i thought i'll speak on a toric i i wells because these are situations where you know uh, the things has to be absolutely perfect so that patients have a very very you know uh, good response after our surgery i hope my slides are visible suresh yes sir we can see okay i think let let's let's talk about something you know, what are the important tips in our know, pre surgery intraoperatively and post op to manage these patient where we implant toric iwls and get the best possible optimal outcome after these surgeries i have no financial disclosure today except for a young generation who have joined for today's uh, this lecture that uh, i am you know going to work for aios in future if you give me a opportunity to become a vice president and uh, society has a huge role where we need to interact with you know various societies of international repute give the access to gener younger generation to achieve better things pre existing astigmatism we all know can be very nicely tackled during cataract surgery and uh, we all understand whenever we talk about astigmatism in cataract surgery it is the corneal astigmatism which we can take care of because after cataract surgery rest of the things are taken care of by intraocular lens so we need to measure the corneal astigmatism two things are important in that the uh, pgs will understand one is the amount of cylinder second most important thing that which is the steeper axis of this uh, uh, cylinder which is very very important because that can be uh, the place where we are going to put intraocular lens in that axis so to get this correctly is two things are required one is the corneal power that can be done by calorimetry or topography second is the axial length of eye if these two parameters are there we can calculate intraocular lens very very nicely So, what are the best options we have for a pre-existing astigmatism 
during the cataract surgery or during along with the phaco emulsification you all know incisional surgery it was there like you can always modify your cataract surgery incision to cause the modification in a cylindrical power by incision modulation or you can do an arcuate keratotomy on the cornea to flatten the steeper axis of a desired amount and uh, decrease the you know cylinder requirement in a post op period other incision can be limbal relaxing incision which was popular sometimes it is a quite a large incision in a very peripheral area regression and very unpredictable results are there no nowadays people are not doing this then other very simple technique was you know occi that is opposite clear corneal incision along the steeper axis that will also increase the flatness in the steeper axis especially people having slightly more than you know point 75 cylinder occi does work in these patients but we all understand nothing better than the single stage simple surgery that with the cataract intraocular lens implantation of a toric design which is predictable has a better acceptability from the surgeon's point of view and patient point of view and we can always look for a, you know the amount of corneal cylinder which may range from a one diopter or more can be corrected with this and all these surgeries are such where any surgery in the body needs to have a very nice counseling to be done for patients and cataract surgery is same for this also so this these are few photographs of a quite a my old uh, slide you can see this is first post op slide towards the left hand side top then to the right hand side our first day and after one month of three months of surgery why this is important because any lens which is implanted inside the eye, especially toric lens, has to be stable in a desired axis or implantation. Not only on the table, immediate post-op, but for a long term also it should be stable in that axis so that connection remains stable for a patient. The stability will depend on a, how nicely the lens is inside the capsular bag. The maintenance of a capsular integrity or bag integrity is also very important in a toric eye implantation also. Let's talk about uh, for a student, what are the indications for uh, using toric IVS? Not every patient we should implant toric. Those are patients, we know that corneal cylinder is regular. Their uh, implantation of toric IVS will be of great help. Any patient who has one or 1.25 diopter cylinder in the cornea should be a case for toric implantation. Low astigmatism less than one diopter is can also be considered in those cases where you are going to put a multifocal or trifocal uh, lenses where the uh, little bit of a uh, residual astigmatism can cause poor outcome in a trifocal lens. The, therefore, it is important to estimate all amount of uh, corneal toracity then subsequently think of that. Standard uh, available lenses nowadays can correct up to around four diopter in a corneal plane. But you can customize these lenses and you can get up to 15 diopter also, depending on a case to case. Larger the amount of corneal cylinder, there are chances that the cornea may not be healthy. Therefore, anything less than four diopter is a good cornea if you do a proper assessment for these patients. Let me take you to a few examples of uh, biometry than a sum of all patients. This is the first patient we have planned for a monofocal posterior chamber IOL. We do the biometry. This is IOL master reading for patient. You can say, see, I have highlighted the amount of cylinder here. It is plus 2.41 diopter, which is definitely more than one diopter cylinder. Therefore, this patient would require a monofocal toric lens because this patient wanted yeah. monofocal lens. If I if we put uh, 85, that is uh, going to carry around for. Uh, 2.5 diopters, the residual cylinder after surgery will be just 0.1 diopter cylinder, which is a very nice outcome for this patient. This is another bi biometry of another patient came for a monofocal IOL, where this effective cyl corneal cylinder is just 0.31 diopter. So this is a good case for a simple monofocal surgery. And the third patient who had uh, come for a demand with a trifocal <laughs> IOL, we saw that you can see the characteristic value is around 0.76 diopter, which is less than one diopter. Normally, if it would have been a monofocal lens, 
this patient should have been all right. But as I said in the beginning, this patient premium IOL case, we need to check if this patient requires toric lens or not. So this patient, we looked into toric sheet and yes, this patient did require a T3 multifocal toric lens. Therefore, it is always important the tolerance of a residual cylinder is less in a multifocal lenses. So you should understand anything less than one diopter cylinder also. You should calculate the toric uh, power and if possible, toric lenses should be given. So that was the indication and how to check the biometry. There are certain cases where you should uh, avoid toric lenses. Suppose patients suffering from an ocular surface disorder, always rule out ocular surface disease by examination. As I always, always tell my students, the first investigation for a cataract surgery should be the biometry, optical biometry if you have. Therefore, you get a nice reading from the virgin cornea without any disturbance to corneal surface. If there's a disease, yes, you should always take care of that also. So any patient with irregular astigmatism, corneal scar, corneal ectasia, patient undergone various other intraocular surgeries, glaucoma, vitroretina, or a refractive surgery, we should assess properly. And intraocularly, a patient has a general deficiency, insufficiency, or a large capsular tear, or anterior capsular tear, which is gone posteriorly, you may not be able to implant toric IOL, though these patients should be avoided. Counseling, as I said, is very, very important. If patient is going for a monofocal lens and we implant monofo monofocal toric, as you know, monofocal toric would be costly than the monofocal, simple monofocal lens. The counseling becomes important because despite putting this slightly costly lens, patient may still require near glasses. If patient demands near vision without glasses, uncorrected, then you should counsel this patient for trifocal IOL with toric variety. So this is very important because whatever we do, sometimes we still have a little bit of residual cylinder remaining. So we always counsel toric our patient. We are going to decrease the amount of cylinder requirement in the post-op period. We never say we'll make it to zero cylinder. So that's a very important point to understand. So what all investigation you should do for a patient with uh, cataract surgery per se or for a premium IOL. If you see here, apart from the detailed ocular examination, I've written first thing to assess the ocular surface and tear film status. I think that is a very, very important investigation for all patients undergoing intraocular surgery or a refractive surgery. Ocular surface has to be checked. How do we check that? Simple one drop of fluorescein in the conjunctival sac. Ask the patient to blink twice and you'll see so many things in the ocular surface which may require a treatment. As patients undergoing cataract are age group more than 50 years, Almost 50 to 60% of cases don't have symptoms of dry eye. But if you stain, they all have a dry eye. So that is very important because these are patients in the post op period. They'll have a dry eye symptoms and they'll eat your uh, day and with a lot of questions. So before you consume this patient for surgery, make sure you do a, this simple fluorescein test for your patients. Type of cataract, nucleus grading is important and always rule out the posterior segment pathology. Sometimes that may be the cause of poor vision, not your surgery per se. The ocular comorbidity has to be taken care of. Do a good biometry and calculation. Manage the ocular surface. If patient has pterygium, that should be operated first. Excellent, you all know, best way to get a good excellent optical biometry. But if you don't have that, next best will be immersion ultrasound biometry. Even if you don't have that, even the contact biometry can be good if it's done by the a trained technician or in a machine which is calibrated. So whichever machine we are going to use, it should be calibrated system so that we get a very nice outcome of a reading for these patients also. Keratometry, I talked about in the beginning, two things are important, power and access. So there are various ways to measure keratometry, which we will discuss subsequently. Always look, see this, take multiple measurements, which is very important for our toric IOLs for especially premium IELTS, at least two separate devices should be used for measuring the corneal power for to check the accuracy. Two things are important, as I said, magnitude of toricity and the steeper axis, which should be almost same in the two investigations. The, this is one biometry of one of our patients. You can see that the examination is not in you know, a proper axis. The eye is tilted. You can see the corneal myers are peripheral 
and the, it's not hitting the fovea. Therefore, reading will be haywire in this patient. This patient shows are almost two diopter cylinder. But if patient fixes properly, you can see absolutely central fixation in the fovea. You can see keratomatic myers are right in the central area. Actually, this patient did not require a cylinder. It was just a spherical power. The important thing to know here is the patient should fix properly before you do the excellent measurement because we are looking for a phobial excellent measurement rather than any other area. Otherwise, your power calculation will be different. So this is a patient with little bit of a distortion in the keratometry mice. So this is the telecentric uh, dots from the Isle Master 700. You can see they are all distorted. So this patient has a poor ocular surface. So we put some drops, lubricating drops in the side, and we took the reading after a few five minutes. You can see a nice reading. Instead of uh, having a cylinder of around two diopter, patient doesn't have a cylinder. So it is important to know that if patient's ocular surface should be checked. In fact, sometimes it is the optometrist or person who is doing biometry tells us the patient has the pathology. So that is the importance of knowing. Terasium, again, you should operate terasium if it gives you a high cylinder like this patient, wait for a four to six weeks to stabilize after terrorism surgery. Once the characteristic values are stable, then take this patient for cataract surgery. And the initial reading of a high cylinder may not be required subsequently or amount of uh, toracity may decrease. So anything which disrupt the ocular surface, you should be careful like uh, ectasia, keratoconus, as I said, post RK patient, it should be very, very important to uh, check this appropriately. So this patient has a corneal scar, but has a nice reading of 1.3 diopter cylinder and steeper axis 163. The same patient we checked on other device, this is eye trace. There also the amount of cylinder almost similar and, and the axis is also within a 10 degrees of a previous examination. So this patient would be a good for a implantation also despite having the peripheral corneal opacity or scar. So it is always important to realize the what is the aberration of cornea. You can see the corneal higher operation uh, or an aberration slightly raised. So these cases you should examine again and counsel the patient. They may not achieve a good results also. So apart from that, we need to look into corneal aberration also. I think this is the last point which I like to highlight in a pre-op examination. The importance of knowing the posterior corneal astigmatism. So this is slightly important in cases with the premium eye will because as I said, little bit of cylinder can be challenging in these cases also. If you look into anterior corneal surface of the cornea, which is always acts like a spherical lens, but it can be with the rule, against the rule, or oblique, and there's a tendency to shift from with the rule to against the rule as the age advances. While the posterior corneal curvature of cornea is always against the rule, and remains stable, which is around 0.3 to 0.5 diopters. In uh, young patients, this uh, you know, adds into your you know, astigmatism, the posterior corneal curvature. But age, as age advances, the so things can be uh, changing because, you, as I said, anterior changes from the with the rule to against the rule. So if you consider only the anterior corneal power, suppose you can't measure the posterior corneal power, if patient has with the rule astigmatism, you are going to always overcorrect your patients. If you patient has the against the rule astigmatism anteriorly, the patient you are going to undercorrect all, always. Therefore, all our patients in a cataract age group do have against the rule much more than the with the rule. So more, most of the time we are undercorrecting our patients. But if you have trifocal lenses, you should have a formula which takes care of a posterior corneal astigmatism also. See this example here. If we look into the anterior corneal astigmatism, only, this is only 0.89. But if you look at total keratometry, which takes into consideration the posterior corneal curvature, which is 1.18 diopter, because the patient has against the rule astigmatism both anterior and posteriorly. So instead of 0.89, we should be correcting 1.18 so that we don't undercorrect this patient. So this, this is the importance of knowing a posterior corneal curvature for our patients. So this is the same example. This patient, if you take only anterior T3, if you do a combined, patient actually requires a T4 and your post visual will be better. Just to look into uh, various ways to measure corneal, uh, posterior corneal astigmatism, there are various instrumentation. The PGs can take this, you know, uh, snapshot of this. It just describes all the devices which can measure the posterior corneal curvature, direct methods, 
predicted formulas which can give you a posterior causal curvature. And uh, this is a various other instrumentation. You can see right, right manual keratometry, automatic keratometry will never be able to give you a posterior causal curvature. Rest other optical devices will give you assessment of posterior causal curvature. So if you are going for a device, we should have those devices which can give you posterior coronal assessment for these uh, day, nowadays. The third important part is the iron power calculation. As I talked about, the best formula, ideal formula should be such, which looks into a coronal power and uh, steeper axis into consideration. Also it takes into SIA, that is surgically induced astigmatism, which may be little different from patient to uh, surgeon to surgeon posterior coronal curvature and effective lens position. Just one word on effective lens position because that is uh, calculated uh, by various uh, parameters. Three parameters would be very important. One is the AC depth, second is the lens thickness, and third is the white to white uh, parameter. According to that, the calculation will be done for an effective lens position. So if you have these parameters and if there is an AI based uh, calculation, then that formula should be selected. To summarize this particular part, when to implant toric eye well, we talked about anything more than one diopter, it should go for a toric lenses. But if you're going for multifocal, even less than 0.75, less than one, up to 0.75, you might have to do a toric eye well. How to determine the magnitude and axis? Take a device which also takes into consideration posterior coronal curvature also. Especially those equipments will be better where you have a OCT-based uh, recording of biometry. So if you look into IOL Master 700, which has a swept source OCT, will give you a best result for your patient. Formula explained very, very nicely. Anything which looks to take into consideration the posterior coronal curvature, SIA, and the effective lens position would be a good formula for you. So that was a pre-operative assessment. I hope uh, student would have understood the importance of doing a good pre-op examination for your patients. The second part of a toric eye will be surgery. Because once you've done a good pre-op examination, surgery should also be done in an effective manner. As I said, the uh, most important thing will be uh, the effective lens position. That means the lens would be resting in a, the capsular bag and the it should be in an axis which is calculated by or marked by you in a steeper axis. Of. Therefore, it is important to see how to get the steeper axis so you can have a manual markings, you can have image-guided surgeries like Callisto or Varion, or you can have intraoperative uh, abrometries also, which can give you analysis of a power and axis also. So these are various ways to do manual marking. I know uh, most of the students will be doing a manual marking only, where uh, people are shifted to a slitler method, where you directly you can uh, put the mark on the steeper axis. Or you can do a freehand marking, which is normally done by a, a bubble marker, which gives you a three-point uh, reference marking. And subsequently, you can do a mark on the cornea also. Now, these are other devices by which you can uh, actually mark the reference axis as well as the uh, placement of IOL also. There are devices which are tonometer marker based, or there are devices which has the sensor. As you go nearer to the eye, it tells you the distance and accuracy also. But most commonly, this bubble marker is one of the commonly used uh, device where you have a bubble here. The bubble should be right in the middle. That tells you you are correctly horizontally positioned your instrument to the, the patient's eye. Intorsion should be avoided. This was a very simple way I should do early when we didn't have the other devices. So first take a pendular uh, thread attached to some weight and get a nice six o'clock marking. Subsequently, use the bubble marker to get a 6, 3, 9 o'clock marking. If you have three marking, that gives you a very nice assessment of this. So this is an example of a image-guided marking being done here. This is a calistro system. This is the incision marking there. Once you have incision marking, your incision is always going to the same area. Your SIA will be almost same. And this has a rexis orientation also. There are two marks. That is between 4.5 to 5 millimeter. So my rexis always will be around 5 millimeter for my case. And it also give you a centration of rexis is also nicely can be done in these patients also. The image guided systems are definitely better. Once you complete your FACO, make sure you 
maintain the integrity of a posterior capsule and capsular bag so that we can implant the lens inside the bag appropriately. I have injected a toric eyewell inside. Now I'll remove viscoelastic from underneath the eyewell and over the eyewell. It is a very, very critical step to remove viscoelastic completely. Otherwise, that may be the cause for a post-op rotation of these toric eyewells. You can see these three lines are basically the orientation for a steeper axis. If possible, your three dots, which are near the optic haptic junction, tells you this is a steeper axis, should be aligning the middle of uh, these three lines. The so accuracy will be much better if you use the image guider systems to get. So uh, you can see here, I've hydrated my own. After the maintaining the entry chamber integrity, I'll just tuck the lens so it rests into the capsular bag and get fixed also. So this manipulation of uh, viscoelastic removal, then subsequently rotation, gives you enough chance for lens to open up to a normal shape so that it doesn't move subsequently also. So this is a uh, manual math you can see. I have already three marks here, six, three, nine o'clock, and this is a ASICO's toric axis marker. So this patient requires the axis of around 111 degrees. Make sure your markings should be very, very sharp here. Very crisp and sharp markings should be there in the periphery, which should be visible till the end of surgery. If you have a hedgy and larger mark, that as such may be around 5 to 10 degrees, then chances of uh, variation will be much more in those cases also. This is a study where we compared manual versus the image guided here. So this is a technique which I showed you. First uh, three reference marking, then putting the axis onto the cornea, then implantation. This is the image guided system where we take the, the image from the IL master to the microscope. And from the microscope, the image is captured, and both images are placed, and you can match the each vessels there, so that you, you can track the image is tracked by the vessels. And intortion or extortion is avoided in such cases to get a very nice centration of these lenses. Visual acuity wise, these you know both the cases we had a good visual acuity. But if you look into the uh, visual function, that is a MTF or a contrast or point spread function, higher order aberration were less in cases of image guided. That's mainly because we had a lesser deviation from the main axis of orientation also. It's very important to understand surgery is important. You can use manual or image guided. But most importantly, if you have access to intraop abrometry like uh, halos or aura, that can also give you access in a complex cases. Which are those like post refractive surgery, cornea, especially post RK patients? Sometimes intraop uh, devices which can give you a IOL power and access is better than the you know, previous assessment, also. And some patients where you have a doubt that your initial calculation may be not correct, especially those patients where your collectivity readings were not matching, intraop abnormality might help in such cases, also. So I, I hope I, you have understood the surgical points. Most important step in surgery is to have a axis marked onto the proper area of a limbus. And that can be taken by the manual or image guided. Then align your lens in that particular axis and make sure it doesn't rotate. That is by removing the viscoelastic completely and maintaining the integrity of the wounds. That is very, very important. And you have to assess these patients in a post-op period. I, I can, I think, just skip this uh, surgery because that's very not important. This is a post-RK patient you can see here, which on a uh, examination, 2.3 diopter cylinder was there. So we had planned toric eyewells. So before that, we wanted to know if this cornea is regular or patient doesn't have a too much of a higher order ablation because that is concerned in a post-RK or post refractive surgery patient. So this is what we did, eye trace. You can see we have done an analysis of a internal aberration and the corneal parameters also. So this is an internal aberration which you can see astigmatism, higher aberration quite high. But if you see the corneal parameters, we had a very little HOA that is higher order aberration, and this patient is suitable for a refract uh, toric eyewell because HOA is less than 0.4, and the patient also has a good MTF and a point spread function. So this is a very important parameter to be checked in all PBM IOS so that you can guarantee that patient you can get a good outcome post-operatively also.
So this patient we had taken for surgery. You can see here, this is the post-RK patient, around 16 incisions. And I'll, I'll do a rexis hydrodetonation. Catric surgery been done. Where is my presentation? You can see the surgery is being completed now. And subsequently, we implant the toric eye in this case also. So one thing I like to tell the people who are doing surgery is make sure you don't hydrate the main wound. Otherwise, the incision will open up and surgery can be difficult. You can see I put one suture here. All my incisions are little posteriorly. That is the little scleral incision so that incision doesn't get disrupted, which is the challenge in a post radiate keratotomy patients. So the one important thing before I close my presentation and take questions from all my uh, students, post-op rotation has to be checked. So I'd like to give you one clue, which are those patients where post-op rotation should be checked? In fact, you should be checking all patients. But in a day one, in patient visual equity is less than six by nine, and patient is not very happy, you should check the rotation of eye well, if it is there properly or not. And most important cause of early rotation is incomplete viscoelastic removal, which I clearly mentioned in my surgical video, how to remove the viscoelastic completely. Nowadays, many surgeons use implantation under BSS fluid only, that is called hydroimplantation. So that might avoid the retention of viscoelastic, may give you a better uh, chance of a lens getting in a proper shape and orientation. And also decrease the post-op uh, spike of intraocular pressure because sometimes OVD can have a chance of a raised intraocular pressure also. <clears throat> but uh, as far as I'm concerned, both techniques are useful. There has been no comparative study per se, but both are equally good in experienced hands. Late rotations are basically because of IOL manufacturing or a type of IOL, IOL design. Or sometimes the eye may be totally, you know, uh, long axial length or short axial length uh, bag which may be a little bigger or distorted bag because of general dialysis can have the you know, possibility of late rotation. One of the major cause of a very, very late rotation is a capsular bag fibrosis. If there's an unequal fibrosis happening, your axis is not completely covering the intraocular lens, then this fibrosis can shift your lens. So these patients have to be seen post-op regularly to assess the uh, what is the cause for rotation and try to take a precaution to decrease that happening by either making the fibrosis less by giving anti-inflammatories or sometimes we make a nick in the capsule so it, so it doesn't contract that much which can shift the lens also. So these are very, very important points to be seen in the post-op uh, patients. Every patient should be seen post-operatively but we know that if there's a rotation happening you can see this, this is the very initial uh, study published way back, you know, uh, in around 2018 or so. Toric lenses, incidence of realignment requirement is less with the, you know, uh, designs, which are open loop or J loop type of L shaped designs are there, which is less than 4%. Silicon lenses will have slightly more. Similarly, plate haptic lenses may also require rotation also. Nowadays, we don't have too many plate haptic lenses. But looking into the recent generation designs, if you look in, look here, the second is Technic Toric IOS, which is around 3.1% uh, case who may require a realignment. But they have modified their design now, and it is now less than, less than, you know, 1% cases requiring. So this shows us that if you modify your designs, because clinical experience will give you an idea what should be done for a particular lens. The incidence can be less than you know, 0.65. As far as my experience of thousands of lenses are concerned, it is less than 0.02%, which is acceptable for all scenarios also. Anything more than 10 degree rotation from the intended axis of implantation, the visual equity may drop down to less than 6.9. And this patient might benefit with the rotation also. So this is very important to know which are those cases where rotation might help. Suppose if I have a patient who has a less than 6-9 vision, I'll, I'll see what is the refraction of that patient. The first thing is check the uncorrected visual equity. Then if the visual equity is less, then see for a, what is the refractive error. If the spherical equivalent 
is more than the cylindrical error. So this patient would have a very less chance of uh, you know correction with rotation because you have more of a spherical error in this patient. If patient has a more cylindrical error than a spherical equivalent, this is a patient might benefit. See the example here, 2.5 diopter is a spherical and one diopter cylinder. The spherical equivalent will be two diopters. So spherical equivalent is much more than the cylindrical power. Therefore, whatever we do, we can't correct this entire error by rotation. Other, way, other case, you can see spherical equivalent of 0.5 diopter only. The cylindrical error coming in a refraction is 1.5 diopter cylinder. So this is the patient by rotation we, we can decrease the cylindrical requirement of post period also. So this is a simple example by just looking at the refraction and you'll know which, that, which is that patient you require rotation also. What normally we do, we uh, look patient, dilate the entire eye. This is the three dots you can see. This is the axis now where the IOL is uh, placed. And we can check what was the initial axis of uh, internal axis that can be checked here. If you see, this is the uh, axis where lens is there. Actually, this lens would have been at this particular red dotted axis. So this patient would require around 16 degree of rotation as per the normal uh, calculation. But if you go to the software, this tells you that you have to put three important data into this astigmaticfix.com, which is ACRS website uh, is there. The planned axis was 85 degree. Current axis is 100 degree. The lens is at 100 degree. Refraction is 0.5, 1.5 cylinder, 45 degree. So if you feed these data, you can see 0 0.5, 1.5, and 45 degree we have fielded. And this tells you that you need to require to rotate 12 degrees clockwise. And this 12 degree rotation will give you correction of this particular case by a cylinder. And the subsequent cylinder will be only 0 0.21 diopter instead of 0 0.3, 3.6 degree, which was there earlier. So this is a significant decrease happening in cylindrical power by the rotation. So this type of examination and subsequent calculation very handy. But even if you don't get into this formula, I just showed in the beginning, simple calculation will also give you the same picture also. So if you have patients like uh, eye trace with you, that also gives you a toric enhancement software where you'll know how much rotation is required of a particular case. And after rotation, what will be your requirement? So this patient needed 26 degree rotation, which would have given a change by 1.56 diopter. And subsequent residual cylinder will be less than 0.37 diopter. So this is the ideal case for a taking patient in for re-rotation or realignment. If patient agrees to your uh, suggestion and visual equity is less than 6.9 or 6.12. But if visual equity is reasonably good, patient is not willing, that you should not take because sometimes patients don't want a re-intraocular intervention and some they may be happy to use glasses also. That's why I talked about the effective counseling is so important for these patients also. So this is one of our patients where uh, we require the rotation. So this is a patient where we had placed the axis wrongly instead of a 178 degree, we have placed a 90 degrees. So this is immediate post-op, one day after uh, initial surgery. With the irrigation on with the side port, you can use the cannula to rotate. And normally within the first few days, the capsule doesn't get adherent to the IOL surface. You can rotate these lenses within the uh, without using the viscoelastic also. But cases where you have a difficulty, you can use viscoelastic and rotate comfortably. People should be dilated well and subsequently place it. There are situations many uh, Western countries surgeons because if you have to just rotate uh, 3 to 5 degrees or 7 degrees, people are doing in a, uh, in a, in a, no, with a needle also in the outpatient department, which in India is a uh, no, remote possibility because the Indian situation may not allow. But you saw this was a large rotation. It has to be done in operation theater in proper way also. So after rotation, this patient was absolutely zero diopter change required subsequently in a re-enhancement uh, prediction of this patient also. So post-operative assessment is very, very important for all these patients. Look for other causes of uh, poor uh, visual acuity. That may be because of poor cornea, abrasion, 
or some complication like a uveitis, coronary edema, wound related problems, or some sort of a posterior segment pathologies. Patient may have uh, we have may have missed the posterior segment pathology, especially the total cathartic patient. You can have macular edema, you can have macular scar. So these things are very, very important to be checked. And always make sure you take a retinal vision pictures to see if your lenses are properly placed in the, the capsular bag. To summarize the post-op rotation part also, like I covered the pre-op surgery part and post-op uh, enhancement part also. The first step is to check the toric alignment. If misalignment is more than 10 degrees or a visual acuity less than 6.9, and this toric um, alignment can checked by various methods. You dilate the eye, take the patient's wrist lamp, you know that which is a new axis also. You can take a retinal mission photograph in image software, you can recalculate the axis also. There are various uh, uh, smartphone based apps available nowadays which can tell you how much rotation is there, misdirection is there, how much rotation would help this patient also. But if you have ray tracing abnormality also, that can help you. The once you know how much rotation misalignment is there, then you require to go into the two softwares. One is the astigmaticfix.com, which tells you clockwise anti clock rotation, how much to rotate and what will be outcome. Same with the ray tracing technology also. The once you do a ray al uh, alignment is needed, normally we should do within a first week. Because within a first week gives you a nice scapular bag orientation as well as the capsule doesn't get added into the IOL surface, rotation is easier. But if patient comes late, after four weeks, six weeks also, then also you should try to rotate these because lens has to be placed in an appropriate axis. But there will be a little bit of attachment of a peripheral capsule with the optic haptic junction and the haptic area also. That should be clearly, you can say, uh, remove, remove the addition, decrease the addition, then rotate the lens also. But there are situations where your capsular bag may be too large, like a very high myopic patient or a patient with the uh, large axial length. The rotation can be slightly delayed also, three to four weeks. So the bag gets little contracted. And this IVL, which may be slightly you know, smaller size in that bigger bag, rotation may be helpful in those cases also. If you do early rotation in such a large bag, the lens will come back to the same area again and you, you might fail into getting correction. Many people suggest putting a CTR in such cases also so that you have a support for a lens in these cases. So you can see this is all uh, very nice to be an article published by my uh, colleague, Dr. Manpreet Kaur. You can read this in an open access IGO journal, which tells you all the important uh, parameters which people have studies and uh, we have compiled the, all the you know uh, literature available for a toric eye and it will be a very nice reading for all of you also. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Suresh and uh, other faculty in uh, GMC for giving this opportunity. I'll stop my share and take questions from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for excellent presentation and nicely covering all aspects regarding toric IUL incarnation. I can see Dr. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. I think we have one question. What is that question? Dr. Priyansh Agarwal is asking which formula is best for calculation of toric eye will power in access? Can the RDA formula be used? Yeah, the, the question from Priyansh is which is that formula which, which we can give you uh, the best uh, uh, calculation for toric IOL power and axis. I think if you have a normal uh, axial length and normal characteristic values, that is axial length between 22.5 to 24.5, all formulas give you a very nice outcome in these cases, especially now with the modern generation formulas, Barrett 2, Universal 2 can also give you very nice. But if you use TK, that is a total characteristic true K in, in a post refractory surgery patient. That might give you a best uh, outcome for your patient. Hill uh, formula also is very, very good because that has the AI-based calculation also. 
And as I said in the beginning, any formula which takes into consideration of posterior coronal curvature, the effective lens position would be a formula for you know uh, getting the best outcome in a turn, especially multifocal IOS. If you have refractive surgery patient, then I think a true K is the better uh, way to calculate. Can you give a formula be used? Yes, yes. Uh, Hill RBF can also be used. Many people use Hill R RBF. And as I said in the beginning, it is important to have your own experience also. Because I know that if I use a particular formula in hundreds of patients, then uh, I can titrate, I can moderate uh, my own way also. But looking to literature wise, if you look into a Hill RBF or a Barrett uh, Universal, they are almost similar. Uh, sir, uh, you mentioned about uh, marking. Preoperative marking is very, very important while putting Torica US. And currently, we are using uh, bubble technique as well as slit lamp method of marking. So, you mentioned about pendular marker as one of the best marking systems. So, pendular. how. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Suresh, pen pendular, you know. Uh... Is, uh, I'm saying because pendular gives a very nice six o'clock orientation. If you just take only bubble marker, you can horizontal uh, plane will be better because you have a bubble in center. That means you are not uh, tilting. But it may be up or down. But if you have six o'clock, then that uh, third marker will be at six o'clock. So my horizontal axis will come perfectly with 180 degree. That is the only concern. That's why anything pendular gives you a better assessment of you know reference marking. Right? Accurate six o'clock you will be marking with pendular and then rest can be marked with. Hello. The time to new. One hour. Sir, very good afternoon, sir. दोबारा कनेक्ट करेंगे क्या कर रहे हैं कर रहे हैं लाइट चलेगी वहां ना नो बैकअप ये कौन है प्रियंक प्रियंक क्या नाम है वो बच्चा नहीं था वो है एक्ट्रेस अच्छा वही है वही है वही है वही है I think webinar का time भी fix होता है चार बजे वैसे ही बंद हो जाएगा most likely
जूम का मैक्सिमम वन आवर होता है कुछ ऐसा है अदरवाइज वन आवर है नहीं नहीं प्लान होता है आप कितना फिक्स करते हो अनलिमिटेड वाला भी होता है सर ये अनलिमिटेड वाला ही बंद नहीं होगा हाँ सुरेश हेलो हाँ जी सर हाँ सॉरी वो लाइट चली गई थी यहाँ पर ना सो आई कैन हियर यू ना जी जी सर यू मेंशनड अबाउट हाइड्रो इम्प्लांटेशन आल्सो हाँ हाँ करंटली आई एम आई एम फॉलोइंग हाइड्रो इम्प्लांटेशन ओनली एंड वी आर इनफैक्ट डूइंग ए स्टडी आल्सो सो वी आर कैपचरिंग बोथ वी आर मेड टू ग्रुप्स एंड वी आर डूइंग स्पेकुलर एंड आल्सो लॉन्ग ट I mean, at the end of three months, the rotation of I U L. So I think maybe in few months we'll come up with the result and outcome. So then we can get it published also. So, but uh, it's working nicely in my hands. Like you, you are much more comfortable after you put the I U L. You don't do have to do anything. Otherwise, <laughs> normally you have to go behind the I U L, remove I mean uh, entire amount of viscoelastic to be. Uh, to feel comfortable at the end of surgery. Yeah, perfectly, perfectly. Uh, you are absolutely correct. But for a uh, beginners, I think I'll still suggest use viscoelastic because that gives you a much more comfort. Difficult situations, this if you have you know small pupil, floppy iris, again uh, it's better incision deformities. Sometimes incision may not be very very you know good or a very long very small incision. Viscoelastic will give you much more comfort, especially patient uncooperative patients. The only thing which sometimes in a like winter condition, if your lens is in a very cold uh, chain, it doesn't open up rapidly inside the eye. So yes. viscoelastic, you know, gives you enough time for the lens to open up also because you have to remove viscoelastic from inside. It takes you, you know, around you know, 40, 50 seconds. That might also give you a time for a lens to open up to normal shape. Hydro <laughs> implantation normally is good, but sometimes there may be a lot of trouble lens for a beginners. You require slightly larger incision from a side port also, for a where your irrigation uh, has to be sufficient also. Many people don't realize, you know, they have an irrigation on when they go with the eye well and entire iris pops out from the main incision. So that also be taught to them what other problems can they face with the you know hydro implantation. But it's a good technique. I think all uh, most of the Indians have shifted to hydro implantation, which is a very, very nice technique. So, Doctor, one question. Uh, when do you plan for OCCI? Any OCCI, you know, uh, normally uh, we used to do earlier, especially for uh, I know patients where your cylindrical power is around uh, one diopter or slightly less than that, and you want to decrease the uh, amount of cylinder in, uh, through the steeper axis incision. There, my main incision will also be in a steeper axis and OCCI will be also in a opposite in the same axis. So we need to mark the axis beforehand. And we have, we have seen that if you use 2.78 of blade, then it's effective. If you use a smaller, like a 2.4, 2.2, may not be that effective in such cases also. And incision should be slightly you know, pre-limbal incision also. It is the not the limbal incision which is important. It is the entry inside the anterior, you know, the proximal end of incision is important. That is more towards the corneal apex. If you are doing a longer tunnel, you may have a little more flattening. If you're doing a slightly smaller tunnel, your uh, 
the flattening effect will be less. But anything more than 1.25, 1.5 may not uh, actually take care of uh, entire cylinder with OCCI. It is definitely going to decrease the cylinder in the cornea. But uh, it will again uh, be, you know, useful in a slightly uh, smaller degree of uh, Sometimes our patient doesn't agree for us uh, toric eye because of cost uh, problem. Then uh, for any patient, 1, 1.25, I'll do OCCI to decrease that uh, amount of cylinder. But nowadays we have access to, a, many people have access to a femtosecond laser devices. They are always combined with you know, uh, the incision into the cornea also. Much uh, better calculated and maybe slightly predictable also. Okay, so LR is still there or LR is to totally obsolete now? LR is totally obsolete because it, it is a limbal incision, very large. It, it is very, yeah. very uh, uh, unpredictable. Regulation is too much sometimes in, inside a lot of vascularization and uh, mm -hmm. patients are not very happy. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, very good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, actually, for the benefit of the students, sir, do we need to do a mandatory uh, OCT posterior segment for this toric patient, sir? Toric IOL patients? No, I think OCT uh, should be done for all cataract patients nowadays. Because yes, we know that, you know, uh, this age group, uh, so many things can be there. So, learning for everybody should be OCT be regular feature for all patients for cataract where you might have to see post-op. Otherwise, for a premium IOL, it is a concern. You should be doing, but many patients may have a little bit of uh, ERM or a, uh, a BMT may be there, macular problems may be there. And that may hinder the post-op outcome. So it is uh, classically, it should be done for all, all patients, but premium IOL, you rightly said, uh, Sarvana, it has to be done. Yes. But if you don't have, uh, then you need to counsel the patient. We do the surgery and see what is the post-op. How early you call the but patient? That's a very good point. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, how early you call the patient, sir, for the toric uh, alignment to see to be seen and check the vision, the post-op? How early you call this patient, sir? What? Day one, we see uh, and uh, all patient pre and post, and uh, that tells you the uh, IOL alignment part. In, what is the position of lens in the bag, visual acuity, everything assessed day one. Okay. And if needed, hardly any patient will require a rotation nowadays because everything is or surgery has become so nice. It's, it's, a, it's not a challenge at all. Just to cover up the you know, talk, I have uh, stressed on the post or rotation. Which is, you may require once in, I know, uh, 200 patient or 300 patient like that. That too by mistake also. Sometimes your assistant might give you a little different uh, reading and you would have implanted in that area. Or some patient where you, during the surgery, pupil constricted or your rexes are not uh, appropriate, there are rexes tear. Those are the cases that lens might shift. Otherwise, a uh, little bit of five to seven degree deviation also, patients are very happy. That's the advantage of our toric lenses, very forgiving lenses. Thanks. Sir, sir, if you have any tear in the capsular axis, so still you will go ahead with toric IUL or when you will, I mean, won't put toric IUL? I think tear no, uh, does happen in uh, some difficult cases. But if my you know, anterior capsular tear and the axis of implantation of a lens in the same axis and tear is uh, both sides, then the uh, lens may not be stable at all. Because that is the area where capsule doesn't support the you know lens and it might rotate in the post-op period. But if you have only one side tear, other side uh, almost is complete, I might put the lens, especially with a high degree of cylinder. But it is important to understand if I have to go for a multifocal, trifocal lenses and your capsular uh, integrity is compromised, then it is a challenge. Unfortunately, we promise patients that we have to put these uh, trifocal toric lenses. Many people will put the lens and see how patient behaves in the post-op period. So normally what happens, uh, the area which is open, 
the capsule, you know, uh, and other areas, the capsule have a different grade of fibrosis. And within the next three, six months, the capsule might contract and lens might rotate. So what I normally do in such cases, the intact capsule also, I make a YAG laser nix in the capsule so it doesn't contract. So in that way, it might decrease the contraction related shift in the lens in those cases. But if PC is intact, most of us will put a tonic lens in that, that situation also. Okay. Sir, in pediatric age group, uh, are you putting toric and if putting how to assess post operatively? And the rotation is also very common because of fibrosis and other so many things. So, how you plan a pediatric age group? Pediatric, you know, if, if the child is, you know, of reasonable age, because pre op assessment is very difficult if a child is less than five years. So everything has to be, you know, intraoperative uh, calculation. So normally I don't put toric lenses in, you know, by very young patient, unless that toric power is more than uh, two diopter cylinder or one, there I might put it. There also uh, we have to take into consideration this uh, uh, eye, you know, but will uh, rotate the with the rule, actually we might change to, uh, against the rule and long run the effectivity will be different. But nowadays, I've seen, I don't do myself, but uh, Dr. Sudarshan does, you know, uh, intraoperative abrometry for all these cases, the pediatric cases also. Then he can implant the lenses. But effectively, if I have to do it, uh, I'll do it patients who are more than uh, six years of age, and they have a slightly uh, significant cylinder. And uh, make sure your, your capsular axis is intact where I don't have to do the primary posterior capsular axis. If I have to do a primary posterior capsular lexis, then things are a little challenging in the posterior period because rotation becomes very difficult. So anything less than three or four, or less than four years where I have to do a primary capsular lexis in the posterior capsule, I will not intend to implant IVs. Therefore, more than six to seven years, that too, if it's slightly more cylinder, I do it. And see how patient behaves subsequently also. Hydrophobic lenses should be implanted. Hydrophilic uh, should be avoided in all pediatric patients. I think good inventory, that is the must, I think, for pediatric age group. Uh -huh, that is true. Yeah, I saw Dr. Sudarshan in RP Center OT last time. Yeah. <laughs> so we had the power print of uh, biometry and then having lens immediately. Yeah. That is the best thing, yeah. Otherwise that is difficult. What, uh, we achieved the RP Center. We have the entire inventory. Inventory, inside that the is the best thing. Uh, if you using the intraop abrometry for your patient, because you require three, four lenses for that particular case, because mm -hmm. your power, your axis uh, might change. The you know, T3 might be become T4 and 22.5 uh, T3 might become 22. In that regard, you require inventory of three or six lenses for that particular case. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Meeting for you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Suresh. We'll meet again and uh, and wish you best for your elections. <laughs> uh, but uh, definitely, yeah. Without support, uh, your support, nothing can work out. Yeah, whole whole Chandigarh with you, sir. Whole Chandigarh will be with you. <laughs> North India. Very brash. Is there? He's, uh, he's ah, is there. And yes, sir. Myself and my all colleagues are here, sir, from Bangalore. Great. Enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> hello, Rajshekhar. Rajshekhar, yeah, hello. Sudesh. Sudesh. <laughs> How are you? Nice. Yeah, we are good. Okay, so, nice to see you. Nice. It's a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Learned a lot. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I, I have a meeting. The, the, sorry to have to leave. Thank yes, you, Rajshekhar. Sarvana, thank you. Thank you, sir.